Here are some high-speed boards I designed that I had also made by GLC PCB. You can see there's some high-speed connections, for example, USB 3, Ethernet, HDMI, MIPI CSI of cameras, and so on. And in this video, I'd like to share some tips and tricks for laying out and routing your own high-speed PCBs. So let's get started. Before we get started, I'd like to mention this video, which is a really great video on proper PC board design and how to achieve proper grounding. This is especially important for high-speed digital or high-speed analog design, and it's given by Rick Hartley, who is a PCB design guru. I highly recommend this video, and I'll leave a link to it in the description below. As usual, this video is sponsored by jlcpcb.com, and this is where I actually have many of my high-speed designs fabricated and produced, as well as assembled. What's a really nice feature with JLC is that they, without charging extra for it, have controlled impedance boards, which I'll talk about later in this video. So for a four layer or six layer board, you can click on impedance control and choose a particular stack up that you'd like. They also have many coupons usually available, for example, this $8 coupon for SMT assembly. So I'd encourage you to use that. In this video, I'd like to go through a few high speed PCB design tips that'll hopefully help you improve your PCB routing and layout when you come across high speed signals, for example, USB 3, HDMI, and so forth. With high speed design, we are typically worried about two things. First of them is signal integrity. For example, there could be problems such as crosstalk, reflections due to impedance mismatches, attenuation of the signal, and problems such as ringing. And we would like to minimize those as best we can. Additionally, we're also concerned about electromagnetic interference, or EMI for short. Before we get into the tips, let's have a look when we actually have to care about all of this. Let's say, for example, you have a 100 megahertz clock signal. The problem might not actually be that the clock signal has a fundamental frequency of 100 megahertz. The problem actually lies in the rise and the fall times. For example, these sharp transitions here and here. And this is actually where the maximum frequency in a signal is actually located. To then calculate the maximum frequency of the signal approximately, if we want that in gigahertz, it's about 0.5 divided by the rise or fall time in nanoseconds, depending on which is faster. Now, when the PCB trace length exceeds 1 12th of the wavelength in the dielectric, then we need to start taking care of our PCB design. So here's one of the high speed boards I designed, and this is an Altium in this case. It really doesn't matter what PCB design software you use. It has high speed interfaces just as gigabit ethernet, USB 3, HDMI, and MIPI CSI for cameras. Starting with tip number one, reference planes. There are three things we need to take care of. We always would like to have a ground or relevant power plane adjacent to a signal plane. So directly below a PCB trace, for example, if you're carrying a USB 3 signal, directly below that, we would like to have a ground plane. In certain cases, you can have a relevant power plane. Relevant meaning it comes from the voltage source that actually generated that signal. This is important so we get a controlled impedance trace, and we'll talk about that in a second, as well as it's important for the return path, which is equally as important as the forward path. Now for AC signals, anything above about one kilohertz, the return path is actually directly below the signal trace. A very important rule is also that underneath traces, there are no splits in the reference plane. Secondly, we need to talk about board stack up. Again, we want to have a ground plane not only adjacent to a signal plane, but also adjacent to a power plane, ideally, if we use those. It's quite good to have a thin dielectric between planes, which gives us tight coupling and also allows us to use thinner traces. For example, for denser designs with DDR memory and so forth, it's quite nice to have thinner traces so we have more space to work with and more space between traces. A nice four layer stack up I typically use is signal on top and bottom and ground in the inner layers. Here's the stack up I've been using for this board and I've taken that pretty much from the JLC PCB website. If you go to the capability section on jlcpcb.com, you can click on controlled impedance PCB layer stack up and then find all the dimensions of the dielectrics and copper in the relevant sections below. And that's what I imported over into Altium. This is a four layer board and on the top and the bottom layer, I have signal layers. And in the second and third layer, so always adjacent to a signal layer, I have ground planes. So for example, if we look at the HDMI routing here, I have my signal traces and directly below on layer two, I have this solid ground plane. Controlled impedance traces are incredibly important in high speed PCB design. The PCB trace and the reference plane directly underneath, as we talked about, which is the return path, form what is known as a transmission line. Now for a given stack up, for given dielectric thicknesses and so forth, we always need to calculate a trace width 
to give us the required trace impedance. This is, for instance, to minimize reflections and to maintain signal integrity. Typically, this will be 50 ohms for single-ended signals, but for example, USB 3 or USB 2 will require about 90 ohm differential impedance. Ethernet might require 100 ohms differential impedance, and you can usually get that by Googling or looking at the spec for the ICs you're using. So let me show you how to calculate the width of a controlled impedance trace. For example, this master clock signal for the camera I've routed as a controlled impedance 50 ohm trace. If I click on it, Altium actually tells me it's about 0.293 millimeters wide. And now let's go over to the JLC PCB impedance calculator to see how I did that. Again, in the capabilities section, click on JLC PCB impedance calculator. And the way to use it is actually really simple. I type in my desired impedance value, which in this case is 50 ohms. I've got a four layer stack up. The thickness of my PCB is 1.6 millimeters. It's running on an outer layer and it's single ended. Then I click on the arrow and it calculates for this stack up for the JLC 7628, which is what I'm using, I need an 11.55 mil wide trace. Actually 11.55 mil is 0.293 millimeters, which is what I used for this master clock signal over here. I could do something similar, for example, for the HDMI traces, which require 100 ohm differentially routed traces. So I type in 100 ohms and I require differential traces. Uh, for trace space, I typically go with about 8 mils, and it recommends me a trace width of 8.08 mils. So that's really, really easy to use. Of course, you can Google different uh, characteristic impedance calculators online, and they will give you similar results. But for JLC PCB boards, this is really easy to use. Trace length and spacing are also very important. We need to keep high-speed traces as short as possible. This helps with EMI and signal integrity. Additionally, we would like to keep different high-speed traces as far away from each other as possible. This is to minimize crosstalk. Additionally, we would like to keep high-speed traces away from things like inductors or power sections of a circuit. A typical rule of thumb is this 3H rule, which means the traces should be separated by at least three times the height of the dielectric between the signal layer and the next ground layer or reference layer. So these three differential pairs are actually part of a MIPI CSI connection. So there's clock and two times data. And as you can see, I've actually spaced them very far apart. This is definitely more than three times uh, H or three times the height of the dielectric between the signal plane and the ground plane below. And this is generally good practice. You want to keep them essentially as far apart as you can, as far as apart as your board allows. Of course, in some cases, this isn't entirely possible, but it's a good practice to do so. With vias, we also have to pay attention in high-speed design. It is generally advised to avoid vias in the signal path. Vias will act capacitively and inductively, and that's always bad for high-speed signals. We also want to avoid via stubs, which can act as antenna, also capacitively or inductively. When changing layers, the reference plane also changes, which means it's actually quite good practice to place ground vias closely next to signal vias to guide the return path. Continuing on with vias, Smaller VAs actually have a lower inductance. So for high-speed signals, if you do have to put them in the signal path, it's advisable to make them as small as you can. However, smaller VAs, of course, increase the board cost. The four-layer stack-up I showed earlier, which is signal, ground, ground, signal, I have two separate ground planes. It's important to improve the return paths by stitching these separate ground planes together with a number of VAs. So in general, I also try to, of course, avoid vias in the signal path, as you can see here. Sometimes, of course, it's inevitable. The nice thing about this signal ground ground signal stack up is that you will not have any via stubs because you go from the top layer all the way through to the bottom layer, for example. So here, when I'm changing layers, for example, I'm placing ground vias, this one here and this one here, very close to the signal vias to aid and guide the return path. For my signal vias, I'm using the smallest possible vias I can with JLC PCB, which is a 0.2 millimeter drill and about a 0.4 millimeter pad or 0.45 millimeter pad. And this will help with low inductance. The two ground planes are stitched together by various ground vias all across the board. And this is what I meant by stitching vias. Lastly, with regards to differential pairs, of course, we need the controlled impedance for those as well. 
but importantly also we need to length match within the differential pairs to make sure that the low and high differential parts of the pairs are matched lengthwise to with a certain tolerance. And then also, for example, in the bus, if we have, for example, a MIPI CSI bus, we'll have one clock lane and we'll have several data lanes. Generally, you will have to length match between those pairs as well. With regards to differential pairs, I'm length matching within the differential pairs to keep the length of one trace the same as the other. So you can see here, and I'm doing that always close to discontinuities, for example, vias or some sections like this. Then I'm also length matching between the relevant signals to make sure the clock is in phase with, for example, these two data lines over here. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it was useful and I hope it helps you with your future high speed PCB designs. This was just a very brief overview and there's much more content available online and in books. And I um, highly encourage you to check more of that out. If you don't want to miss any future videos, please do subscribe to my channel. We are on our way to 40,000 subscribers, which is really cool. Thanks again for all your support and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.